Thank you for watching GH Today on GH1 TV. This is the hard talk segment of uh, this show where we get to look at issues in, with surgical precision and get the people who, are, who matter to give us their views on it. So you can give us your views by WhatsApping us on 0288500600. We've been joined now by um, a lecturer at the School of Communication Studies at the University of Ghana, Legon, Dr. Eche Sikanku. You're welcome. He's a, so a, a media analyst, and we're going to look at this whole issue of wrangling in political parties. Thanks. Thanks You're welcome. Me, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. Show. Yes, indeed. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Good to be here. Sitting and looking at these issues from um, your vantage point as an academic and somebody who studies the political scene, what do you make of wrangling in political parties generally, and specifically to the MPP and with a general uh, a lower degree to the PNC? Right. So, you know, political parties are not monolithic entities they are constitutive of diverse or collective interests and shared interests. So to start with, it is not absolutely um, surprising that there are these kind of wranglings or there are these kind of factions, so to speak, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the political parties because they are constitutive of different diverse elements based on different parameters. It could be ethnicity, it could be values, it could be um, things that you were advocating on or based on regional factionality. So, so this is not entirely new. Um, again, um, one, one famous scholar has said that factionalism or diversity in parties is not, is, 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 is not something necessarily bad. But I think what is the problem is the management of those factions. When you look all across the world, you know, from Europe to America to Africa, there, are di diverse, there is some form of diversity in terms of the constituent of a specific political party. So it's not entirely new at all. It is how that plays out, it is the dynamic of it, and it is how it is managed, and the effects of it, you know, that then becomes problematic. Considering how the, um, some of these bickerings spark off, um, do you think that um, our, our political uh, parties should be able to contain them rather than letting it out the, the way we, 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 we find it. Absolutely. So I think that is where the job of the political parties are. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do as a political party, I mean, the center of our democracy is hinged on the success of our political parties. The political parties are a, are, are a, are a centerpiece of our democracy. Mm -hmm. As our political parties go, so goes our democracy. And so it is absolutely important that these parties do the right thing, organize themselves in the, in the right way. You know, when you look at the political science literature, parties are supposed to perform certain functions. They are social organizations. First of all, let's look at their definition. They are social organizations with a representative function. So they are constitutive of people with values and needs and they have to represent individuals. So they do have a role to play in a democracy. At any point in time, we do have the party in government and then the party in opposition. Each of these constituent units also have a role to play, the opposition and the government. You know, one famous scholar said one thing, he said, democracy is as much an ideology of the opposition as it is of the government. So we do need both of them to function. And so yes, it's important that they manage those to, to help their existence. Following on from where you actually ending, I'm, I'm thinking the consequences could be very dire. Yes, it could be because, for instance, if you take the NPP as, as, as at this particular moment, they are an opposition party. Who the have, biggest one at that. The biggest one at that, right. Who are bedeviled um, uh, um, with internal wranglings and factionalism, all of that. It's kind of an albatross on their neck. And so one of the negative effects of that is that it prevents them from performing their functions as an opposition party, both normatively and practically speaking. Opposition parties are supposed to hold the government accountable. They are supposed to serve as a watchdog. They are supposed to serve as a voice for the voiceless, provide alternative policy, participate in legislation. All of that has not been fulfilled in the most tested sense as we expect them to do, just because there is this, um, there's this stagnation mm. and this focus on internal wranglers within the party itself. So yes, the effects could be negative and dire. Indeed, Dr. Sikanku, Will the MDC benefit from what is happening to their biggest opponent? Well, I mean, well, politically speaking, politically speaking, um, yes, it could happen. Because once your opponent is in disarray, once they cannot even organize themselves, 
to pursue or to function or to fulfill their roles first as a political party and secondly as an opposition party. Let's not forget that one of the truest definitions of an opposition party is to see it as a government in waiting. And that's where we always have this notion of a shadow minister for energy, shadow minister for that. So they have to be ready at the get-go to be in government. It's a government in waiting. It's almost like a government in fighting. Right but now, now it's home ex exactly because there, 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 there's this um, focus on the infight in the mm. internal wrangling, mm. Mm. which is opposite what is expected. So, yes, it could benefit the opposition party depending on how the they governing party it could benefit the governing party. The, the right? governing party, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It, could, it, it could benefit the, gov the governing party depending on how the opposition manages it. But um, you, I don't know if you're aware of um, some suggestions that the NDC probably could be behind all that is happening in the, in the NPP. And, and if that is true indeed, um, isn't that worrying? Absolutely. You know, I mean, we are getting into what we call real politic. You know, the hardcore um, um, execution of political, um, political game or political dynamics or strategy. Okay, so yes, it, it, it is possible that there are molds. It could be possible that it is a strategy that you're using. But then at the end of the day, these things could just be speculations, they could be Sorry. true, they could not be true. But I think that the onus rests on the entity itself, the NPP itself, as an organization, to make sure that they are addressing these issues in the right manner. You know, so, yeah. so oh, Kathy, take it. Yeah, I, just, I, I want to just jump off on that point and, and, and even go to a question that I asked the, 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 the gentleman from the NPP, and he wasn't willing to, to answer that question. But I'll ask you because you're an academic, you have nothing to gain or lose from it. Yeah. How important is ethnicity mm -hmm. to politics in Ghana? and with specific reference to the MPP. Because there's this uh, idea that there's a, a divide and that there are factions which are, have been aligned on the basis of ethnicity. So you have an Ashanti faction and you have an Achim faction. Uh, is it perceived or is it real? Well, you see, um, uh, Kavui, ethnic groups are n natural, organic units, you know, that are constitutive of our society as we know it in Ghana. And it is one of the peculiar features of African societies or of our political system. And so we cannot delink these ethnic-based cleavages from our politics. In the same way, when you go to other places, comparatively speaking, when you go to Europe, you know, you go to Eastern Europe, Western Europe, I mean, you know about some of the wars that have been fought there, the mm. Balkans. Most of it has been based on ethnic associations, ethnic identities. Some of, the, some of it has been religious. Some of it has been political. You go to the United States, it's the same thing, race. You know, it's just that it plays out in a different way. So we are not different from other people in the world. So, so it's, it's not entirely different, mm. you know. So, so that's fine, you know. The, the, the question, though, is that when a political party is formed, it is an organization which seeks to and, and, and envision or um, exemplify the wishes of different groups of people. And democracy encourages diversity, it encourages participation. And so your goal as a political party is to make sure that you are appealing to a broader spectrum of people. It is okay if your party um, as a basic unit or organization just seems to spring off a certain ethnic or regional basis. So it becomes a world bank for it, yes. for want of a better word. Yes, that's completely yeah. fine. Mm. I mean, we have it with the Republican Party. When you go down south from Texas to the southern states, absolutely no way Democrats can make any inroads there. You go to the northeast, Massachusetts, the bluest, most liberal, most democratic state, nothing, even if you, as they say, even if you put a wood, I mean, they're going to win. <laughs> you go so, to Ghana and Volta region is almost guaranteed for the, the NDC. Yes, yeah, so okay. let's, let's, let's not run away from those things. Mm -hmm. This is just the peculiarity of what our African based system is. I mean, the important thing is to make sure that we are being open, we are being accepting, we are accepting criticism, because when, whenever criticism dies, freedom dies. Does MPP accept that they have this ethnic um, split, cleavage? Do they accept it? They well, seem to run away from it. They keep telling us, yeah, national party, the national party. And, and without really accepting that, you have a chunk of your support coming from one particular part of the country, which you must keep your eye on. Well, I mean, that's, that's for them to answer and that's for them to um, analyze but I mean we as, 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 poli as analysts or as politicians or as observers of the democracy or as observers of the voting pattern I mean you know anybody can take the voting results and then say that well this is where the strength of this party is this is where the strength of that party is but then there are underlying dynamics as okay. far as that is concerned which sure. 
I mean, the first stage to resolving the problem is to accept it, mm -hmm. you know, and then. So y yesterday we had um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Kwame Pienim. Um, he's obviously calling for ceasefire. Right. Um, Dr. Rekubwebe comes out as well and uh, on a more controversial note, mm -hmm. um, saying that, well, in, in the wake of all of these suspensions, um, in the future, we probably could be seeing the suspension of even the president. Um, Dr. Arthur Kennedy from mm -hmm. his US base is still talking, right. and I've heard him on different platforms where he talks about how disappointed, for instance, that he is in the party flag bearer, and, and things that probably, and I know is the cause of uh, you know, all the bickering that is going on in the party. W what is your take on everything that is playing out? Well, so what I think should be done is that there should be an effort um, in, term, in, in terms of conflict resolution. I mean, let's accept it. You know, conflict does not have to be violent for it to be violent, you know. And, and so it, it, it can be based on values, it can be based on culture, it can be based on ethnicity, it could be stereotyping. And sometimes these things are the underlying factors that could play out if they're not solved into violent conflict. So, I mean, what's the definition of conflict? You know, as Kafu and I know, it is the presence of disagreement, variance, yes. or incompatibility, mm -hmm. you know, within any social unit or within any social organization. I mean, it happens in families, it happens in churches, it happens in organizations, you know, and definitely, of course, in a political party where people are opinionated and people where people have strong um, cleavages or strong attitudes or perceptions as to how to run a large entity as a nation. Of course, there is going to be diversity of opinion. There is going to be diversity of, um, of thought and process and strategy. So, so, so that, that is not so bad in and of, in and of itself. B but when there is some form of incompatibility, some form of variance and divergence of these particular approaches or attitudes, then it becomes a problem. So there should be an acceptance that, well, hey, listen, everything is not okay at this present moment. Mm -hmm. There is a certain amount of variance at this point. Yeah. There is a certain amount of incompatibility at this point. What are we going to do to solve it in order to move forward? And that is something that people have ignored, both within the media, both within our politics. Their consideration of appropriate conflict resolution mechanisms to manage the variances and dis disagreements within our entities and units to make sure that they are fulfilling their goals as we expect them to do. Let, let, let us better understand this because then th there is another group that is saying that okay no let us play by the rules of the game because I think uh, Mr. Pianim yesterday mentioned the fact that let us forget about all of these suspensions let us you know put all of them behind because we have work ahead of us and then somebody comes to say that, no, we definitely have to play by the rules of the game. You know, definitely disagreeing to this call from Mr. Pianin. Um, let us understand exactly what you mean by how that we can together forge this. Okay. And before you answer that question, hold yes. on to the question. We're going to take a quick uh, look at what's happening in, in the world, the world in 60 seconds. You're watching GH Today. I'm here with Dr. Sikanku from the University of Ghana. We're here. And my own queen, We're B. Here. Besua. So, World in 60 Seconds, right here on the show. Stay with us. All right. <laughs> Police have killed at least three Muslim protesters after opening fire in the northern city of Kaduna in Nigeria after activists accused soldiers of having killed hundreds in a massacre in a nearby town. North Korea's highest court has sentenced a Canadian pastor to a lifetime of hard labor for crimes against the state. The Toronto-based pastor, who is of South Korean descent, reportedly confessed earlier to a subversive plot to overthrow the government and set up a religious state. Malala Yousafzai has condemned the call by U.S. hopeful Donald Trump to ban Muslims from mentioning the U.S. She was speaking at an event to mark one year since a Taliban attack on a school in Pakistan left more than 140 people dead, mostly children. In 2012, Malala herself was shot in the head by the Taliban. Destructive wind of more than 200 kilometers per hour has left South Sydney this morning. Current records show that two people from the suburb have been taken to hospital. Forecasters in Australia have explained that this wind speed was close to the fastest ever registered in Sydney, Australia. You're watching GH Today. This is Hard Talk with uh, Dr. H.A. Sinkanku from the University of Ghana. And um, I'm here with uh, Queen B. Beswa. And we're talking about political wrangling 
in, um, in Ghana and uh, he's given us insights as to exactly what's happening and how it can be resolved as far as managing of conflict is concerned. Um, Ache? Yes, so I'll, I'll continue from um, your question. Yes. Yes, so in terms of the way forward, you know, when you look at the, the definition or the explanation for what conflict resolution is, there are three things. One, there should be a movement towards an agreement between the incompatibilities that exist. Do you see that happening with uh, the actions that have been taken, the suspensions of the, those three executives? Uh, is that step one? That is step one, because uh, as we know it, they call them to a, a committee, sort of, mm -hmm. disciplinary committee, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure at that particular event, hopefully, they were given the opportunity to air their views. Sure. Or, sure. Yeah, and then based on that, I, and depending on what, how the process went through, mm -hmm. um, they still decided that they were going to suspend them. But the expectation normally is that th these would not take an adversarial form that they would take the form of um, dialogue or discussions and that hopefully it would lead to some form of compatibility or the merging of views I mean, as a result of this particular process. Sure, sure. So well, they've taken the first step. Okay. We'll see what will happen. All right. um, secondly, they also, both parties within the conflict have to agree to exist despite their incompatibility. So they have to recognize the existence of each other peacefully. <laughs> that is not happening. Mr. Afoko still thinks he's chairman. Well, so uh, Mr. Crab does not recognize <laughs> the suspension. No. And Mr. Ajapong is not even there, there, talking. There's a lot <laughs> happening. So I, I really see this ceasefire call, you mm -hmm. know, very difficult thing to do. I don't know. Uh, Do you think that uh, the, the walls of the MPP w will go away <laughs> before 2016 elections? Well, I wish I could see through the. Um, um, I mean, I wish I could be that prescient. But um, I, I, I think that we should be hopeful. The, the evidence shows that they are still a long way away from the total resolution of it because it is, uh, people are still harboring some form of um, antagonism, some form of bitterness. Uh, people are not totally satisfied. They go on air and like you said, uh, Paul Afoku obviously does not still think that um, he still thinks that he's the chairman. And so it looks like there are still some unresolved issues. The, 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 so, so they do need to take those steps because we do know, and we've seen it going to the third. So I mentioned two things, the, the agreement, the peaceful coexistence of each other, and then the last thing is that the absence of violence. And I think that is evidence to show that the conflict has not totally been resolved because we have seen some form of violence, the scuttling of the press conference mm. at a particular point in time. People said they were firing off guns and so on and so forth. So it, 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 it does presuppose this on the basis of the data or the evidence okay. that there's no total conflict resolution. And so the more work needs to be done. Okay. Let's talk about the data evidence uh, with a man who is very familiar with figures. He's a nationally, internationally recognized uh, pollster and he's the managing editor of the Daily Dispatch. Uh, Mr. Ben Efson is on the line through to GH Today for the very first time. Ben, good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Kafu, and good morning, Bishu, and good morning to Dr. Efson. Good morning, Uncle Ben. Good morning, Dr. Efson. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Efson, sorry. Ben, so sorry. tell us, um, from where you sit as an analyst, um, how does the political wrangling in the MPP reflect on their chances of making a significant, significant impact in 2016 for the election? Thank you. I, I, I believe that even when you have a set of twins, there are differences. So in a political party where people are kind of with different views, the wranglings are bound to happen. But I think that two things stand out. One, the nature of issues which lead to the wrangling. And two, the recognition by the party itself that if we joke with this wrangle to affect us, MPP and DC, MPP has only two factions. You see, I saw your, your, one of your previous guests denying that they are factions. Careful, it's like when your mother is dead and you say she shall sleep. After the third day, when the body starts to decompose, you run into the mortuary. Yeah. NDC has three factions, which is even more dangerous than the two MPP has, because three people, three sides, two are bound to go against the other. The difference, Kafui, is that the NDC factions are based on personalities, Muhammad faction, most faction, Rawlings faction. 
the NDs MPP one is based on ethnicity. That is the problem they are facing to recognize. So once they recognize that, then they can have problems. I, I saw Mr. Tefa, the MPP for National Gaza, saying denying about. Everybody knew that, as at the Tamale Congress in 2014. The three persons who have now been suspended were perceived to be from the Kufour faction and the others from um, the Nanado faction. Or Hini to who is the general secretary, has said that the suspension seemed to be targeting those who are from the Kufour faction. Uh, Uncle Ben, um, so, um, you, and you have said this time without number that indeed there are factions in the party. Uh, would you say that with what is happening in the NPP now, it is um, what I would call factionalism gone bad? That is true. Ohinto is a leading member, and he agrees with my point. He said it last week, that it seems that the suspensions have been targeted at those perceived to be from the Kufo faction. I mean, you see, the Council of Elders with due respect, seems to have selective amnesia. When, in the run to the presidential elections last year, and there was a guideline issue that no constituent executive, no member of parliament should openly support a presidential candidate. They were there, they were around when the MPs, when the various constituency executives were falling over themselves, trooping to Nakufado's residence, to openly declare their support for him. Where were they at that time? In September this year, when the Council of Elders wrote to the disciplinary committee petitioning that a focus should be suspended, they determined the nature of punishment. They said he should be suspended till after the 2016 election. That's not lie in your remit or ambit to, to send somebody uh, to this royal committee, and you determine the punishment. As we speak now, there's another petition against Atta Kennedy to be suspended. One of his crimes is that he's been criticized in Anadu. But, but, uh, Uncle Ben, um, you don't believe that um, probably all this is happening because of the issues that have come up. Here we are, um, yesterday we heard um, um, Dr. Uh, Kwame Pienim, Mr. Kwame Pienim, for instance, say that Let's put all of this behind us. Um, Dr. Rekubebe actually has come up to say that, look, if indeed we're seeing all of these suspensions, there should be a time where we actually suspend the president at uh, um, Kufuado. Presidential candidate. Uh, presidential candidate Kufuado. Uh, what do you make of, of this, these comments? It tells you one thing. Even constituency chairman, whose members had come to Accra to demonstrate the support of Kapoko were suspended. I see those supporters are in the, in the room and the chairman opened the room for them to come out. It is getting ridiculous now. You see, when you want to instill discipline and you are being selective, the way and manner that it is being done, I mean, if you look at the transcript that the dispatch has been publishing of Front Complaint Japan faced uh, the dispatch committee, they, they, they played audios to him, they recorded personal audios in which he said that he was disrespectful to the presidential candidate. They questioned him that the car he was using was bought for him by a leading member of the MPP so that the NATO can lose. So clearly, you can see for the petition. That this is what they are targeting. And from September, the, the, the cast of elders slept because Mr. Gambilla, who is a member of the Council of Elders and the MP member of Parliament for NAPTAM, said that, and that was in September, said they are going to suspend a focal and complain Japan, but because monkeys play by sizes, they have to set on Star FM, they are going to suspend a focal first and complain Japan and next. That was in September. It has come true. So if they think that they can have this wrangling, now many people are just keeping matters to themselves. They will stay in the party, they will not talk, and they will piss in. 
Quick point, Ben. I before... don't think that those people who feel angry will go and form a political party. But there's going to be a relatively high level of apathy when, when it comes to elections time next year. So in your analysis, Ben, you don't think that this may lead um, to a, a formation of some group that will now constitute itself as a party, but you think it's going to be just uh, apathy, won't go out and vote, let's see you do what you think you can do. Is that how you see it? Yes, that's I, I mean, I think that, you see, if you've got your full political party, 11 months is a short, a short time to make an impact. And if you find a political party, that means you are cutting the umbilical cord with the mainstream party. The history of small parties have not been effective. But being inside and pissing in is even more dangerous, Kaffee. If you go, everybody knows that you are out. The man will stay and say, oh, don't, don't mind. And uh, MPB should take a cue. They should just ask themselves, why is it that the percentage of votes for Ronaldo has been dropping since Kufour's time? Kufour got 74% in 2004. Ronaldo dropped to 72% in 2008 first round and dropped further in 2012 to 70%. They should ask themselves. Well, well thank you very much, Ben Efson, the man of the numbers and modern-day Nostradamus, uh, figuring out things that are yet to happen. He's a managing editor of the Daily Dispatch. He's a pollster and a media analyst. Thank you very much, Ben. You're watching GH Today. And we're talking about political wranglings, uh, in, especially in the, in the MPP. Your comment is welcome across social media. You use the hashtag GH Today. Dr. Sikanku, yes. he said something critical that I want to just bounce off you. Sure. He said, look, the NDC's factions are based mainly on personalities. But it appears to his analysis that the MPP's factionalism is based on, 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 on support for uh, Kufour or, or support for... Uh, Nanado. But it's that, in the end, may translate to some ethnic consequences. Is that not correct? It is possible. It, it, it is possible. And, and in addition to that, he also said that one of the things that you need to do is to look at the root causes of the conflict. And I think that's one thing that we've seen absent in this entire discussion. So, yes, the question needs to be asked. I mean, what is the root cause of it? Is it based on ethnicity, ethnicity or ethnic cleavages? Or is it based on personalities? Is it based on region? Or is it based on issues? Is it based on ideology? So they need to sit, and that's what constitutes the analytic process. So they need to sit down and then see where it's coming from. And then based on that, make sure they address. And it could be a, a multiplicity of it. You know, we never know. Uh, Dr. Rekubebe made um, an assertion yesterday I found very profound. And right. he's talking about how that in the 2012 elections, um, um, Nanado, um, got lesser votes from Achim where he hails from, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. compared to Preston Kufour in the 2004 elections. And, and they think that this, in fact, he thought that this is not a party that is ready to win or par. Mm. Was he referring to lesser votes from Achim or Akan, from Ashanti? From Achim. Okay. On, on Nanado's part, okay. compared to Preston Kufour, meaning President Kufour did better right, right. in 2004 than he did in mm. 2012. Right. And then you said it, it, it means it's not a party that is ready? Yeah, he, he thought that this definitely is not a party that was ready to win elections. Well, he's, he's making his analysis based on, based on data, right? So he's doing a longitudinal um, study or observation of the pattern. And then he comes up and says, well, this is what is happening. I think what it is is that definitely there could be a factor of apathy, which he mentioned. You know, sometimes when members of a political party do not feel accepted, you see, and that's the other thing. Maybe, and when you do the conflict analysis, there's another thing called the conflict dynamics. You need to know the structural issues within the particular conflict. Maybe people think Afoku, Ejipong think they're not being involved in the campaign as much as they should. They are not being involved in affairs. They are being sidelined as much as they should. So, so all of this, I mean, within any social entity or organization, all of this could lead to alienation. It could lead to um, apathy within the political party. And maybe the result of that is that people do not turn out to vote because um, that's one way to protest, one way to... But you, you know, we know that for any political party, one of the easiest ways to get over the crossing line is not just to appeal to a broad base, but to also get out the vote in the places that are your areas of strength. If you lack that, and that's what happened to the Republican Party. They didn't like who their candidate was. Uh, Mitt Romney, they didn't like who mm -hmm. their candidate was. And so a lot of people did not turn up to vote for him. And that 
um, helped his opposition party. So these things could lead to the drop or the reduction of the vote and then would be um, inimical to the fortunes of the political party. Well, we thank you for your insights. Yep. Uh, Dr. Sikanku is a lecturer at the University of Ghana and he also watches the media and politics and you've given us uh, real uh, deep insights into how these conflicts come up and as most especially how they can be resolved. Thank you very much. You Thanks know, to both of you for having thank me. You. Thank you. And, and Kafui, I, I, I don't know, but you know that there's a lot of talk also about the fact that, hey, here is a party that probably wants to win, win elections. Forget about what Dr. Rekubebe says, for mm -hmm. instance. And so we have to definitely approach all the you know, negative vices that are kind of working <laughs> against you. the party. But I hey, you. I think in all of it, the ceasefire thing very important. We, we, in fact, I think other political parties have to give the NDC, you know, some run for their money. Come 2016, I want to see that happen with the NPP and indeed the PNC and all of the other, the other political parties. So you're still watching GH Today. We're live on GH1 TV. Our question for the day, again, if there were six apples and you took away four, how many apples would be left? Great, I got it there. <laughs> so if there are six apples and you take away four, how many apples um, do you have? Um, don't forget that uh, there are prices at stake. Yesterday we couldn't award any packages because we didn't have any winners come through. I hope that you, you're, you're texting you're texting um, to our short code, uh, WhatsApp number, ra rather, 0288-500-600, 0288-500-600, or um, tweet at us at GH1TV um, on Twitter, and then on Facebook, GH1. Okay, so we take a short breather. When we come back, my favorite segment. Don't go away. <laughs>